Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical security advice along the way. I'm your all-around network security nerd and host, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting July 7th, 2014. So I've been on leave for a few weeks and I've missed a lot of security stories, but rather than go back in history, I'm going to stick to three security stories this week, but I'll be combining two weeks worth of security stories. So I need to jump in with updates. There's been a lot of security updates that have gone by the past few weeks. Let's start with last week where Apple released a number of security updates. They released a iOS update, an Apple TV update, and more importantly, a Mac OS X update that fixed 20 security vulnerabilities and a Safari update that fixed 10 security vulnerabilities. Now I suspect the Mac OS X and Safari one are the biggest one. Both of those updates fix some code execution flaws. So if you use either of those products, you might want to go get those updates as soon as you can. On top of that, this week was patch week. And as usual, we covered both Microsoft and Adobe patch day. Microsoft patch day brought six security bulletins and two of them were critical. The big one was probably the Internet Explorer patch, which fixed well over 20 vulnerabilities in the popular browser, including many memory corruption flaws that bad guys can use for drive-by download attacks. So if you're an Internet Explorer user, go get it. The second critical vulnerability affected Windows, specifically a component that comes with Windows called Windows Journal. It's a, basically a note-taking or journaling product. In any case, if you have journal, a specially crafted document can actually execute code on your computer if you haven't got this update. Now, Windows Journal doesn't install on the server versions of Windows by default, but if you're a normal Windows desktop user, you probably have Windows Journal installed and you want to get this update immediately. By the way, often when there's things like document vulnerabilities, like Word or PDF vulnerabilities, I can't really recommend you block Word or PDF files because they're very important for businesses. You use them every day. However, journal files, which are file extension .jnt, are not quite as important for business. So if you have products like WatchGuard's XDM Appliance, you can actually block these documents right at your gateway, which is a good way to prevent bad guys from exploiting this vulnerability. Anyways, besides the journal and IE flaws, there's also a number of other medium impact Windows updates. And there's one server software update that affected a component called Service Bus. Essentially, Service Bus is a a messaging communications protocol that, that enterprise web developers can use for their applications. Uh, not everyone uses Service Bus. In fact, Windows itself doesn't really use Service Bus by default. But if you have any enterprise developers that have used Service Bus in any applications you've created, it does suffer from a denial of service uh, flaw. So you might want to update that as well. Finally was Adobe Patch Day. And this month was kind of light, but it was an interesting patch. This month, Adobe patched Flash and it fixed three vulnerabilities. Two of them were called system bypass flaws and uh, according to Adobe, you could use them to take over a system. But a more interesting uh, update was the fix for something called the Rosetta Flash vulnerability. Now this is a very complex vulnerability. I'm gonna actually leave it up to this person's blog post to describe it. Uh, really, it's a way of encoding files in a really specific manner, encoding flash files or SWF files in a way that they're ASCII files, but the benefit of this this to an attacker is a uh, flash can actually do certain web application calls, specifically something called a JSON P call. So if you can encode flash in a certain way, you can actually make calls to third party domains. And if you can get a victim to go to your malicious flash, that means you might be able to get the victim to make calls as themselves to say Google site or YouTube site. And then as an attacker, you gain some of that user's third party domain information. Now, besides patching flash to fix this vulnerability, vulnerability as a victim, uh, this vulnerability if, did affect sites like Tumblr and Google and eBay and a couple of other sites as well, but all of them have since fixed their web applications as well. In any case, if you want more information about Rosetta Stone, and it is kind of interesting, be sure to check out the link I put in the blog post associated with this video. 
So my next story covers a new botnet and how Facebook is upping their malware analysis game. During the week, the Facebook threat team released a blog post identifying how they uh, found a new botnet and helped authorities track down its authors. The botnet's called Lekpotex, and Facebook's blog post describes it in a lot of detail. Essentially, it looks a lot like uh, most botnet malware. It arrives in a number of different ways, as Java files, as uh, VBS scripts, or as emails with a zip attachment. And if you interact with this particular attachment or Java file or however you get this particular botnet, it infects your machine in many stages and installs a number of different potential droppers, one being a Litecoin miner. Litecoin's another type of Bitcoin and it turns your computer into a miner to help monetize this for the criminals. Facebook's blog post describes it in a lot of detail if you're interested. And while Facebook was tracking it, they kind of tracked it down to some Greek authors and they helped the Greek authorities essentially catch these guys. And the blog post very interesting if you really like to learn about malware and one of the big points Facebook talks about is how this malware was pretty smart at evading antivirus and host-based security products. Most botnets nowadays are doing all kinds of different antivirus evasion techniques, which by the way is one reason you really need some sort of advanced threat or advanced malware protection product like what WatchGuard recently announced, APT Blocker. But in any case, I found it a very interesting post uh, about how Facebook tracked down these authors, so check it out. And I also like like to see social networks, especially really big, well-used ones like Facebook, are really starting to take security very seriously. The final and arguably biggest story this week suggests that manufacturer infected hardware may have become a reality. Over the years in the InfoSec uh, community, there's been many stories and, and maybe even conspiracy theories talking about how hardware from China or the Asia Pacific might come to the US pre-infected with, with malware. For instance, there's companies like Huawei that make routing equipment that the US government's afraid of, and all kinds of horror stories about various equipment made in China that that can infect your business right out of the box. This week, there seems to be some evidence supporting some of these big claims. During the week, a research company and security vendor called TrapX released a paper outlining a campaign, an advanced campaign, where allegedly Chinese-based attackers infected hardware uh, that was targeted and used in shipping and logistic companies in the US. Essentially, they're these hardware scanners. Uh, logistic and shipping companies have these scanners, hardware scanners where they can scan uh, codes on things that are shipped and it gives their ERP or enterprise resource planning system information about whatever this thing is that's being shipped or handled. Well, TrapX found that a particular vendor's uh, hardware scanners had been pre-infected with malware, as well as the Windows systems that support these scanners. So out of the box, a couple of unnamed shipping and logistic companies had scanners that were infected with malware. And when they got these scanners into their network, they of course connect wirelessly to the network, the scanner started automatedly uh, scanning for SMB or Windows networking computers to try to further infect their organization. And on top of that, if they couldn't find SMB computers, they started doing R-admin, which is another type of network uh, communication protocol. Long story short, when it did get some other Windows computers in the organization, they eventually had automated code to find the organization's ERP, or again, enterprise resource planning system, and were able to steal information. And furthermore, TrapX uh, kind of tracked the command and control channel, which seems to lead back to China. So it's a very very, very interesting story around where hardware that you actually bought and pulled out of the box came pre-infected. Now, TrapX isn't claiming whether or not the manufacturer that sells this hardware knew about it beforehand or if it was a mistake. But one interesting little hint is TrapX also found that if they went to this manufacturer to download firmware upgrades for this hardware, the firmware update also had the malware or the backdoor infection installed as well. And it wasn't until TrapX uh, contacted the company that suddenly the firmware turned up clean. So it's still unsure whether the manufacturer is directly involved, but if you have a tinfoil hat, it seems pretty suspect. Now this is a big story and this ties to the Internet of Things too, by the way. There's many different computing devices we were starting to buy that don't look like computers, but they connect to our network and can work just like computers. So we really need to think about uh, how we bring in new devices into our network.
And this is also why I really highly recommend gateway security appliances or network security appliances, not just host-based security. If you have a host-based security system, it's not going to identify some of the malware running on these non-typical computers. And it, it also is designed often to evade host-based systems. Meanwhile, if you have a network security system, it kind of acts like a honeypot and it can detect weird traffic like scans for SMB servers or scans for R admin. So network-based security devices can actually find things that host-based security controls can't. In any case, a very interesting story. Be sure to check out the links to the report I put in the blog post associated with this video. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you found it interesting and educational. But as always, there's a ton of other stories and there's a ton of stories I missed during my leave. So be sure to check the reference section in the blog post associated with this video for more stories, including ones about how the U.S. authorities actually captured an alleged Russian cyber criminal in the Maldives, but Russia now is accusing us of kidnapping him. Quite interesting. In any case, if you like more security information on a more regular basis, be sure to follow WatchGuard Security Center, where you can find this blog post and many others. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuard Tech. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.